Hello, and welcome to the Board Game Diner, where we're serving up a full menu of fun of the cardboard variety. I'm John Fliss, and I'll be your server today. This is the golden age of amazing, challenging, and fun board games unlike anything most people are used to. And here at the Board Game Diner, I'm serving you a collection of welcoming games. Fun, accessible, easy to learn games that everyone can enjoy. And at the diner, you get a flight of games in every episode. Today, I'm serving up party games. A lot of times when people are over, someone says, hey, let's play a game. And sure, there are the usuals that come out, apples to apples, cards against humanity, balderdash. On the menu today is a collection of games that are great for larger groups of people and can really make for a fun night. I'm gonna mix things up here right off the bat. Normally I start with something people may have heard of, but I'd be surprised if you've ever heard of this. It's my emergency game. Emergency game, you may ask? Yes, I am such a game nerd, I carry this little game around with me in case there's a situation where someone says, let's play a game. This one is super simple, anyone can pick up right away. And it will play up to 18 people, and it fits in your pocket. It's a little wallet game by Button Shy Games. They make games that consist of 18 cards, and they have dozens, with many, many great ones that I will cover at a later time. This one here is called Invino Morte. It means, in wine, death. Let me show you how it works. There are 18 cards. Nine have wine on them, nine have poison. One person chooses a card to give to every person, including themselves. No one gets to look at the card. Then, the person to the left of the starting player has a choice. They can drink, turning their card face up to reveal it, or they can switch with someone else without looking at the cards. This continues around until it gets back to the starting player. At this point, anyone who hasn't flipped their card over does so. If it's poison, you're dead and out of the game. If it's wine, you survive to the next round. You gather up the cards, pass them to the next surviving person, and then you play again. You eventually get down to a one-on-one -on -one face off. At that point, the head games you're playing reach peak level. And it's like that scene from The Princess Bride where one is trying to figure out where the dealer put the poison. You know, you know that I know that you would put the poison here, so I'm going to pick this one or do this. It's super simple and it may take a round for people to get into it. As you play, everyone realizes the mental games you're playing and a lot of trickery ensues. And it's so quick, if you get poisoned and knocked out, you're back in it before you know it. One word of advice, be careful with this. Played it with my kids and their cousins and then they went home to their parents saying, we played this great drinking game with Uncle John. Oh boy. <laughs> There will be some more head games coming up, but for now, let's have some fun with words. If you're a fan of Scrabble, Balderdash, Bananagrams, if you like words and making connections, if you're a fan of SAT analogy tests, yeah, I know you are, these are for you. In just one, three to seven players are working together to get the guesser to guess the word. While that player has their eyes closed, the other players write down one word clue that will guide the person to guess correctly. Here's the thing, after everyone has written down their word, they reveal them to each other. Any duplicates get erased, and whatever's left is shown to the guesser. So the key here is to come up with a word that's not the first thing you think of. This is really fun, and while there is a way to keep score, this is one of those games that's just fun to play, and, and the score doesn't matter. Speaking of games where points don't matter, let's talk So Clover. This game enamored me from the get-go. So Clover plays three to six, but really, you can play it with two as well, because like with just one, who keeps score? It's just fun to do. Each player gets a four-leaf clover and a dry erase marker. Then they take these square cards and place them in the settings. Now you're faced with four pairs of words. On each clover leaf, you have to write one word clue that fits the clue pair. I really like randomly placing them on there, but if you want to make it easier, you can always choose how they go on. Cheaters. Once you are done, you remove the four cards and shuffle in a fifth unrelated card, and then you hand it over to the group. Now they're tasked with figuring out what goes together. When they think they have it, you tell them, yes, you succeeded. 
or you remove the incorrect ones and let them go again. After they try again, they get a point for whatever correct ones they have. I really enjoy every part of this game. I love the challenge of trying to figure out the right words to connect to, sometimes absolutely random words. I also love puzzling out what fits where, trying to decipher what the other person was thinking. So Clover is so fun. Now we're taking those word connections and turning them into an actual game with a winner and loser. Get ready, the gloves are coming off. Code Names plays two to eight players and takes only about 15 minutes to play. In it, you've got two teams of spies, red and blue. Each team selects a clue giver. On the table is a grid of random words which are supposed to be the code names of fellow spies. That's about all the theme you get from this game. The clue givers have access to the guide showing which cards belong to blue and which belong to red. They also show the dreaded assassin card. If either team picks that one, they lose the game immediately. So the clue giver has to give a one word clue and a number of cards they're trying to connect. For example, barbecue three. Now that team has to work together to figure out what three words connect to barbecue. They point to their guesses one at a time. If they get it right, they claim it and can guess again. If they pick an innocent bystander, it's marked and their turn is over. If they pick the opponent's word, it gets marked for the other team and their turn is over. This is a great game to handle bigger numbers of people as long as they can see the board. There are also a zillion versions of Codenames. My son has a Harry Potter themed version. There's also a specific two player version called Codenames Duet. Let's keep the spy theme going as we talk about Spyfall, a game of hidden roles, interrogation, and fast thinking. All players are secretly dealt a location card, revealing where they are. They are all the same except for one. One person gets a spy card and has no idea where anyone else is. Then the questions start. Someone can ask another person a question. They are trying to deduce if that other person knows where they are. like. Why is it so noisy in here? Or what's with the get up? Everyone is trying to figure out who the spy is without revealing too much information. Because if the spy can figure out where they are, they can stop the game, call out the location, and if correct, take all the points. At any time during play, one player can accuse another of being a spy. If everyone else agrees, that person reveals their card. If the spy is uncovered, all other players get points. This is a neat concept, but one I find a little too stressful for my tastes. If I'm the spy, I'm very nervous, but even if I'm not, I have to think fast to try and get information I need without revealing too much to the spy. I've had some doozies of questions that I still haven't lived down in my game group. There are also roles printed on the location. So for example, if you're on a cruise ship, you may be a chef or the captain or a passenger. So your answers could be from that character's perspective if you want. It makes for a more interesting game that way. There's also a couple other versions out there too. Keeping with the spies in hidden roles and adding a whole lot of yelling, we're trying another game called The Resistance. Fun fact, if you saw the last episode where I talked about Coup, this is in the same universe. The Resistance has five to 10 people trying to uncover who among them is a spy. As a group of Resistance operatives, you have five missions to carry out to help topple the oppressive government. However, there are spies among you. The spies know who each other are, but no one else knows. You attempt to select a certain number of people to carry out missions, the group votes on the choices, and when the mission is carried out, each player gets a success and fail card. Players who are selected for a mission all play their cards face down into the center of the table. Resistance members obviously always play successes, but a spy can choose to play success or fail depending on what they want to accomplish. It's best of three out of five. If there are three successes, the resistance wins. Three fails mean the spies win. There's so much yelling in this game, I love it. I had someone stone cold light in my face the whole time, only to reveal their deceit after winning in a surprise reveal. It was so amazing, so much fun, but sometimes you can only play a couple of games of this in a row and then you, need to have, you have to do something else. It can get a little intense. I recommend it at five to seven players. When you get to the eight to 10 number, it sometimes feels like people can get left out, but it's an awesome experience. Yeah, yeah. Last game on the menu today is on the exact opposite spectrum. It's a betting and racing game called Camel Up. 
In Camel Up, two to eight players are betting on five camels racing around a track. They are betting on each individual race leg and the overall winners. So on a player's turn, you can take one action. You can take a bet on a camel to win that leg. The earlier you bet, the higher the reward. You can also bet on who you think is going to win the overall race. This has a high return for being first, but each wrong bet costs you. And lastly, you can move a camel. You get a coin and you get to shake up this cool dice pyramid. Camels have matching dice that let them move one, two, or three spaces. This is where the upsets and craziness happen, because unlike in real life, these camels can stack. When a lower camel moves, it carries everything above it, and whoever is on top is in the lead. So last place could suddenly jump to the lead and win it all. I've seen it happen. The stacking camels are usually the cause of the yelling that I referenced earlier. Once every camel is moved once, that leg ends. You pay out and collect on those bets, reset the dice pyramid, and start a new round until one camel wins it all. This game is made by the stacking camels. As I said, I once placed a long shot bet to make an amazing comeback, but in order for it to pay off, three dice had to come out exactly in order to let that last place camel stack and stack until it crossed the line in victory. And when it happened, the whole table erupted. That's what makes this game so much fun. Well, that wraps up your time at the diner, so let's go over the check. Today we had a packed menu as we chose between wine and poison with In Vino Morte, tried to think differently with just one, made word connections with So Clover, gave clue giving some added danger in code names, traveled all over, sometimes not even knowing where we are with Spyfall, hunted out spies in our midst with the resistance, and raced camels with lots of yelling in Camel Up. Normally you would tip the server, but at the board game diner, the server has a tip for you. Today's tip, learning the rules. When playing a new game, the worst thing you could do is whip out the rule book and start reading while the entire group is waiting to play. Or worse yet, start reading the rule book to them. No, no, no. So I'll help you tackle the how to play. The easiest way is to learn from someone who already knows how to play. However, I'm assuming none of your friends know how to play the game. Otherwise, you would have played it already. That's when you head online. Search how to play whatever game you want on YouTube. There are tons of teaches on there. One of the best to learn from is Rodney from Watch It Played. He's got straightforward, well laid out instructions for many, many games. You can watch the video as a group, or you can watch it beforehand and then teach it to everyone. If there is no video to learn from, or if you learn in other ways, grab the rule book and start reading before you get to game night. Many of them are laid out great with illustrations and example turns. Some of them, though, not so much. If that's the case, then good luck. Try your best to decipher how to play. You can also search online for clarification. It doesn't happen often for me, but you can get stuck with a bad rulebook sometimes. After you read it through, I find it helpful to do a run through of the round. I'll set up the game for a couple players and try to run through a round while following along in the rulebook to make sure that I'm getting it. I like to be prepared if I'm going to teach others. I don't want to look up and see people staring, waiting for me to figure things out. The last thing I like doing once I have things all settled is to just play over in my head how I'm going to teach it. What I will say to everyone, the order I'll explain things, I usually give a broad overview, what your goal is, and then walk through a turn. A lot of times you can start playing and then fill in the little details as you reach them. For example, sometimes there are different cards with different actions on them that pop up throughout the game. A lot of times, I'll wait until they pop up to explain how they work, rather than running through all of them at the start. You don't want your players falling asleep before you get to play the game either. Sometimes it seems daunting when you approach one of these games, as they are different and more complex than roll a die and move three squares and do something. But I say, don't let that dissuade you. There's a lot of joy and fun to be found in conquering the challenge of these games and finding the fun with your friends. Well, that's all the time for today. Thank you for visiting the Board Game Diner. Hope you become a regular. Next time, we're going the exact opposite direction of party games. When you find yourself all by yourself and wanting to play a game solo. Until then, game on.